The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic and Typebond, with a special finishing feature sponsored by Osmo. All right, so today we've got a bit of a different project. My brother-in-law just moved to Colorado and had this table from his previous house. Now, it was perfect for that house because it was a little bit smaller, but in the new house, there's more room. So a table of this uh, small diameter, I think it's like 36 inches or something like that, um, it just isn't really working for them. Two adults, two children, they need something a little bit better. Uh, and I checked it out and it's really just pocket screwed into the top. The base is in pretty good shape and it's a painted base. So I figured, you know what, let's put a top on that matches their new floors and see if that doesn't work a little bit better for them. So it's a fairly simple construction, just a bunch of red oak boards cut into a circle. Uh, but before we do that, let me show you the underside of this table so you could see why I decided this would be easy to do. So each apron just has a couple of pocket screws up through the apron and into the top. So it's a super easy swap out and no need to make an entire base for this one. So let's get to it. Because I want the table to have a more substantial look and feel, I'm starting with five quarter red oak. The boards are cut strategically to remove any major knots or temperamental grain. Once we have a decent layout, we can number the boards to keep them in order and then start the milling process. Because some of the boards are wider than my jointer, I'm going to use a special trick that involves removing the jointer guard. If you do this, please exercise the highest level of caution and don't be a dingus. And be sure to replace the guard as soon as the operation is complete. The Wood Whisperer Incorporated is not responsible blah 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 blah. The board is jointed like any other, only there's a small portion of the board that overhangs the bed and doesn't get cut. After a few passes, we've got a nice flat 8 inch wide section and then a small rough strip. At the workbench, we'll use a hand plane to remove that small strip and make it level with the rest of the board. There's a variation of this technique that uses a piece of plywood and a planer, which can be faster if you have a lot of these to do, but for a small piece or two, this method is nice. Plus, it gets your heart rate up for a few minutes, which isn't a bad thing. Now that we have a nice flat surface for reference, we can send the boards through the planer. It's a great feeling not having to sacrifice board width just because of the size of your jointer. By the way, that good looking guy right there is Nicole's brother Jason. Not him, that's George Costanza. Believe it or not, he's my new shop helper, so you might see him, or at least his arms, in a lot of my future videos. Not him, him. The boards are all ripped to width at the table saw, removing any gnarly bits from the edges. With the boards together, I'll mark the center, and then use a straight edge to get a ballpark idea of the circle size that we need to cut, which has a 24 inch radius. To assist with the glue up, I'll drop in the occasional domino. This is by no means a necessary step, but on a wide panel like this, the dominoes make for a stress-free glue up experience without the need for giant calls. For a little more working time, I'll be using Type Bond Extend. The glue is added to each edge, rolled, and the dominoes are popped in. I'm lucky to have some long parallel clamps, but pipe clamps also work great for big glue ups like this. Once the glue is set up but not fully cured, I scrape it away with a card scraper. After the glue is dry, the surface is sanded to remove any glue residue. Now it's time to cut a circle. We'll flip the table upside down and prepare to make a simple trammel arm. I'll cut a piece of half inch MDF to about 8 inches wide and 36 inches long. These aren't critical dimensions. It has to be long enough to make the 24 inch radius swing and wide enough to hold the router. Regarding the thickness, just make sure that your bit can plunge all the way through when sitting on top of the trammel arm. One side of the board will get a small dowel pin a few inches from the edge. I'll then measure from the center of that point to another point exactly 24 inches away. My bit is 3 8 in diameter, so I'll measure 3 8 further to help define where the router bit will plunge. For the dowel pin, I'll drill a quarter inch hole through the trammel arm. On the underside of the table, I'll drill the same hole in the absolute center, making sure that I don't go all the way through. Using a quarter inch dowel pin, I can drop the trammel arm in place, and you can see how this is going to work. 
To make the dowel connection a little bit more rigid, I'll add some CA glue on the jig side. To help the arm slide with less friction, I'll wax the bottom. On the other end of the jig, I'll line up my bit and trace the shape of my router. This helps me line up some double stick tape for securing the base to the trammel arm. If I were doing more than one table like this, I'd probably make something a little bit more secure to mount the router, but this is going to work for just one circle. Because the bit will eventually go through the top, we need a sacrificial surface underneath. I'll use some more double stick tape to secure the tabletop, as well as the off-cut material. We really don't want anything to move during this process. I'll go about a quarter inch per pass, working my way around the circle and sucking up any dust that remains in the groove. If you're a fan of cartoons, you're probably expecting me to fall through the floor. Me me. And just like that, we have a perfect circle. Now as a completely unnecessary step, I'm going to cut a face grain plug for that quarter inch hole that we drilled in the bottom of the table. Ah, that's better. For the profile of the top, we're departing from a traditional OG profile and going with something a little bit more modern. This is a big honking bit, so I'm going to use my big honking router. I'll take it in a few passes. On the bottom edge, we'll add a small eighth inch roundover. The bottom gets a quick sanding to smooth everything out. Since it's the bottom, we won't really go crazy here with the surface prep. Around the perimeter, we'll give some extra attention to the edge where there might be some lines from the multiple router cuts. For the show face at the top, we'll start by scraping the surface to remove any mill marks. Scraping is nice because it reduces the amount of sanding that we'll need to do. And I do like sanding with at least my final grit after the scraping. Scraping leaves a decent surface, but I really prefer the uniformity of a 180 or 220 grit sanding. By the way, when sanding a large roundover like this, it's best to sand with the grain to avoid any cross grain scratch marks. Red oak has really deep grain and open pores, so for a kitchen table, I think a pour fill is called for and we only need to fill the top side. This particular filler is water soluble, and this can is pretty old, so I'll scrape the solid material out and then dilute it with water to the consistency of pancake batter. Mmm, pancakes. The filler is spread across the surface, driving it into the pores. Once dry, we'll scrape the excess and sand the entire surface smooth. The idea here is to keep the filler in the pores, but get the rest of the surface back to bare wood. For the finish, I'm using Osmo Pollux Oil Pure. This is their low VOC product. It applies pretty easily by putting a little bit on the surface and then spreading it out to a very thin layer. Now, for full disclosure, I have been testing Osmo on several projects over the course of the last year, and I did purchase all those materials myself. I've been very happy with the results, and after filming this project, I approached them about sponsoring the video. So, what are they paying me for? Basically, to spend a little more time showing you what products I'm using and how to apply them. Nothing more. As always, my opinions are my own, and I was going to use this finish with or without the sponsorship. Anywho, once the finish is spread out, I go back and use a paper towel to quickly wipe away any spots where I have some excess. Now I let it sit for an hour, and then come back and repeat the spreading process one more time. A finish like this has some distinct advantages. First, it's low VOC. You still want some ventilation, but this stuff isn't going to knock you on your butt. Second, it's fairly durable. It's not really a true film finish, but the layer of wax left behind is definitely hard and does a great job of locking out liquids. Third, it's really easy to apply. It's pretty much dummy proof. Fourth, it's incredibly easy to repair. When this table gets scratched up, we'll be able to do spot repairs without having to completely refinish the top. Once I let that second coat sit for another hour, I come back with a white Scotch-Brite type pad on my random orbit sander. This not only drives the finish deep into the pores, it also lightly abrades the surface, making it super smooth. I then finish off the surface with a terry cloth buffer. The process is then repeated on the top. The only difference with the top side finish is that I'm going to add an additional level of protection using their top oil product. It's a high solids finish that's completely food safe once it dries. I'll wipe on a thin layer using an applicator pad. 
You can also roll it on with a microfiber roller or buff it in with Scotch-Brite. Now since this is red oak, I'm a little hesitant to apply a thicker layer because it's likely to result in air bubbles in the finish. So I'll just wipe on two thin layers instead. No runs, no streaks, just a perfect smooth satin finish. It's cool. Nice overhang too. So there it is, a pretty quick and easy upgrade. Now it's a table that's fit for a family of four. A nice finish on there that they could beat up and uh, if they're anything like my kids, they're gonna take forks and drag them across the surface. So we've got a finish that's easy to repair, which is a good thing. So all in all, pretty quick weekend project and uh, looks pretty good.